This is CBC News. At 12 o'clock, we're at plus six with mostly cloudy skies over downtown Winnipeg. Good afternoon, I'm Matt Humphrey. A new poll shows Wab Canoe's popularity is soaring. The Angus Reid poll found 63% of respondents approve of the Manitoba Premier's performance. Christopher Adams is a political studies professor at the University of Manitoba. I am surprised that it's gone up by six points, that that it's not just as high up as it was last time, but even higher. And um, so for that, I really feel sure that there's a a honeymoon continuing uh, into the new year. Adams says Canoe faces little opposition and hasn't since he was elected. He says the NDP's first provincial budget it will be a true test of Canoe's leadership. Adams also says the poll sampling of Manitobans is very small, with fewer than 400 participants. Top diplomats are in Jamaica today for emergency talks on the crisis in Haiti. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken left Andrews Air Base for Kingston this morning. The meeting includes leaders from the United States, France, the Caribbean, and Canada. Armed gangs are terrorizing Haiti's capital and say they want to overthrow the government. Bob Ray is Canada's UN ambassador. He says the talks in Jamaica will focus on rebuilding Haiti's government. We have to get a consensus among the political parties and civil society as to how to move forward to build a transitional team that will then take the, the country towards an election. Haiti has been without a president since Jovenel Moïse was assassinated three years ago. The prime minister is now governing, but he's been locked out of the country and is being pressured to resign. The ship that was supposed to deliver tons of food to Gaza remains docked in Cyprus. Late last week, European officials announced the creation of a maritime corridor to bring life-saving aid to the besieged enclave. The ship, laden with some 200 tons of supplies, was supposed to be the first to arrive to Gaza this past weekend. But three days later, it remains in Larnaca, Cyprus. Heavy rain in Bolivia's capital has prompted authorities to declare a state of emergency. That's the sound of heavy machinery pushing sludge and other debris from the streets of La Paz. 3,000 troops have been called in to deal with the crisis. Flooding has led to destroyed homes, power outages and damaged roads. Drinking water is also being contaminated. The floodwaters killed at least one person in La Paz over the weekend. More than 50 across Bolivia have now died due to heavy rains this season. The House of Representatives in the United States will vote this week on the fate of TikTok in America. The popular app is owned by a company in China, and that's sparking security concerns about the way it's used and how it stores data. Richard Madden has more from Washington. Few issues unite to divide Congress more than taking on big tech. Last week, lawmakers on the House Energy Committee voted unanimously to ban the wildly popular social media app TikTok from being downloaded on app stores in the U.S. unless it divests itself from its parent company, China-based ByteDance, within six months. Now, for years, U.S. intelligence agencies have warned the Chinese government could access TikTok user data for nefarious purposes, identifying targets and creating mass disinformation campaigns to disrupt elections and sow chaos. Now, TikTok denies it and has urged its 170 million American users with a link to call their members of Congress to complain. Offices were reportedly bombarded with a wave of calls. Now, a bill is expected later this week in the House, and it would then go to the Senate, where its fate is unclear. Richard Madden, CBC News, Washington. At least 50 people have been injured by what officials describe as a strong movement on a Chilean airplane. It was traveling from Sydney, Australia to Auckland in New Zealand. Latham Airlines says there was a technical event during the flight that caused the movement. It did not elaborate. Officials in Auckland say most of the injuries were minor, but 13 people were taken to hospital. Athletes from across the circumpolar world are in Alaska for the Arctic Winter Games. This is the first time in years the games are being held outside Canada. Cheryl Kawaja has your story. Team Yukon! From Alaska to Greenland, participants parade into the opening ceremonies, 2,000 altogether. Canada's Governor General Mary Simon steps up to the podium. Can you all say, Please never to give up. This time, just getting to these games proved extra challenging. For some Northern Canadians, getting a passport was down to the wire. The very last day, 
the last four passports were delivered while kids were there staging at the airport to get on their flights. John Rhoda is the president of the Arctic Winter Games International Committee. I mean, literally, Service Canada flew to Kuchuak to deliver the passports. At these games, there is a great emphasis on sharing northern culture and coming together as members of a circumpolar world. Cheryl Kawaja, CBC News, Matsu, Alaska. And for news anytime, head on over to cbc.ca slash Manitoba. In Winnipeg today, mainly sunny, a few clouds this afternoon, a high around plus 6. In Brennan, a mix of sun and cloud and a high of plus 4 degrees. In Dauphin, a chance of showers with a high of plus 6. In Flin Flon, a high of 0 and mainly cloudy with a chance of flurries. In Thompson, increasing cloudiness with a high around plus 3 degrees. And all the way up in Churchill, mainly cloudy, a chance of flurries and a high of minus 1. You're listening to CBC. Good afternoon, Manitoba. You're listening to Radio Noon here on CBC Radio 1, 89.3 FM, 990 AM and everywhere on the CBC Listen app and the CBC Manitoba YouTube page. I'm Corey Funk in for Marjorie Dowhouse. Good to be with you on this sunny spring-like Monday afternoon. Well, coming up this hour on the show, Polly Wanna Home? (laughs) Coming up, we're going to take you to an exotic bird rescue where relinquished and retired parrots go when their owners can no longer take care of them. That's coming up later this hour. But this half hour on the show, even though there's still some snow outside, some people are already thinking about spring gardening. We're going to talk to the co-owner of a greenhouse about what trends are starting to grow for early spring. But first, firefighter shortage in Thompson. We're going to hear more about that. Firefighters in Thompson are raising concerns about a shortage of staff. Eight positions in the Thompson Fire Department are vacant. That's a quarter of the 20, that's more than a quarter of the 24 positions that fill its roster. At the same time, 20, uh, 2023 was the busiest year on record for the department. And they say together, this puts the city at a, quote, crisis point. Captain Travis Myris is a fire paramedic and union president of the Thompson Professional Fires Fires Association. He recently spoke with CBC's Chelsea Kemp. Uh, it was a very busy year for our for our mem- membership. Uh, we had a, a lot of calls, uh, a ton of overtime being worked. We had a lot of vacancies within our department. So it was definitely uh, a challenge for us to, to get through to th- uh, 2023. And I know looking just at your Facebook post, it says it's the busiest year on record. Is it busy because there were so many calls? Is it busy because maybe there was more overtime or is it kind of a combination of both? It's a combination of both. Um, what we've, Our trend that we typically see is about a, a rise of calls by about 11% almost every year. So, you know, every every new year is busier than the last. And then, you know, with with having vacancies within the department, we uh, we end up uh, end up being able to necessarily backfill as fast as we'd like. Uh, we end up with a lot of overtime. I mean, we had about we we're not a 24-hour um, shift work department, but we had about 250 inst- instances of uh, firefighters working 24-hour shifts. And w- what is it going to look like going into 2024, especially when it comes to needing more staffing? Well, I think it's challenging. I think it's challenging, you know, everywhere across the board, but maybe uniquely so within the north. You know, wages are are not quite as comparable as some of our southern counterparts. Um, so that, you know, that sort of trends into recruiting and, and things like that as well. So, um, but the pool of trained responders is getting smaller and smaller as the many of the larger western um, fire departments and paramedic services are snapping up those people as fast as they can. And, uh, yeah, so it's a de- definitely a challenge for us. I think it mentioned that there's 600 extra hours of work per member. Is that right? It, it's a, approximate. I mean, we're rounding off our figures a little bit, but it's a, a very close approximate, yes. How long have you been up with the Thompson Department? I've been here almost 22 years now. How how does it compare right now to when you first started? Are things getting better? Are they getting more challenging? I mean, our, our call volume when I started on the job was probably about a quarter of what we're doing now. Um, we had a little bit less staff back then. 
Um, we were sitting around 20 um, full-time positions. We only expanded that to 24 over the years. Um, so, so it's the workload has increased exponentially, yet the number of members on staff hasn't really kept up with those changes. Is that something that could help with recruitment? Most well, certainly. Um, you know, we'd, we'd love to see that, you know, expanded upon and built upon. And, uh, I mean, there's there are city has had some ongoing discussions um, with the UCN and stuff like that with regards to primary care paramedic being taught, as well as possibly um, developing a similar public fire protection program. Um, but it would be really... There's a lot of value if we could have something like that up here and have northerners train the north for the north. And so what do you see as the future right now? What what would best help get the department fully staffed? I think, um, you know, mutual agreements with uh, government with regards to funding, building uh, uh, up the ability to, to train and have responders within the north. I think that would be a big, big help for us. So I think it really is a, uh, a collaboration that needs to occur. Uh, sooner than later between, you know, entities like the city of Thompson, the the province of Manitoba, uh, you know, our, our, some of our educational facilities or institutions. Uh, so I, I think that's the way forward, really. That was Captain Travis Myris, a fire paramedic and union president of the Thompson Professional Firefighters Association. Eight of the 24 positions are currently vacant at the department. He was speaking with CBC's Chelsea Kemp. Chelsea also spoke with Thompson Mayor Colleen Smook, who is well aware of the shortage. This isn't a brand new problem. We've been working on it for years. Uh, actually, it started back in uh, 2019, 2020, when we brought a proposal forth to train firefighter uh, paramedics slash paramedics uh, here in the north. Uh, we had uh, got all the funding in place. Uh, we had the uh, programming in place. Uh, we had all the northern people in place. Uh, we were working with the fire college in Brandon to work, bring this program here. And then at the last minute, UCN decided that they couldn't be the catalyst to provide it, even though we had everything ready. So then that basically got put on the back burner. And since then, we have struggled, and I've just been at some meetings uh, out of province and that. We're all sort of in the same boat, struggling for the same thing. Uh, Thompson uh, has been seen so far as a community of 13,000 is what, you know, we get in the census. But we actually serve a population of 60,000 plus. And again, with our ambulance services, over 50, we have five, five, five different uh, uh, companies providing air ambulance and that to Thompson from outlying communities. And again, we're the ones, the catalyst to pick them up and get them to the hospital. And I know talking with the union, they described it as being, well, at a crisis point for a while now. Should like public sa- should people be concerned about public safety? Uh, really, our our firefighters and paramedics, they go above and beyond. So t- to be perfectly truthful, uh, they they do the extra work so that our city and our communities don't have to worry about public safety. But even just uh, in the last couple days, uh, we had a call for an ambulance service to go way out of our territory. Uh, Well, you know, 50 miles, but that's, you know, still he's an hour gone, an hour back, only to get there and realize that they weren't needed. So there definitely has to be a different system in place, even when you're they're uh, dispatching our ambulances. And what's happening is all the dispatching is happening out of Brandon, like 900 kilometers away. So they don't understand the north. They don't understand the distances in a lot of cases. So we basically have to get it down that it is our region and that we're working for that. And I think it, it takes, and the government is listening, and we've given them some different ideas, and they know how desperate we are. So to say are we in uh, danger or people, no more so than anywhere else in province or in Canada at the at the time. And do you think things are going to start to change? Do you foresee it getting easier to recruit now, especially with the change in government? Well, actually, to be truthful, we weren't 
before, uh, you know, we had lots of projects from the last government, so I can't complain. But it seemed to be in the health care and this area that we didn't. So even with this uh, critical shortage with uh, ambulances and firefighter staff, uh, I wrote sort of a strong letter about a month ago, six weeks ago, to Shared Health, because basically that's where uh, the issues lie. And they answered us within a couple weeks. We have now set up biweekly uh, meetings with them to deal. So I really feel that we are being listened to. We've only had, you know, the initial meeting, and there's another meeting coming up. So I definitely feel uh, much stronger. And in talking to some of the ministers when I was at uh, Prospector Developer Convention in Toronto this week, uh, they definitely understand our needs and uh, will definitely be working with us. That was Thompson Mayor Colleen Smook speaking with the CBC's Chelsea Kemp. You can read more about this story on our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Communities in Focus is back. CBC wants to get to know the communities we serve a little better, and this time we're coming to St. Laurent. I'm Emily Brass. Join me March 11th to 15th and share the stories of your community. Let's find out what St. Laurent is all about. Communities in Focus. Visit cbc.ca slash Manitoba slash community for more. Twelve sixteen right now. You're listening to Radio Noon here on CBC Radio 1. I'm Corey Funk in for Marjorie Dowhouse. And still to come on the show, it's never too early to start thinking about spring, especially if you run a greenhouse. We're going to hear how one co-owner is prepping for planting season. That's coming up in just a few minutes here. But first, let's take a look at your current conditions around the province, which are very spring-like right now. Brandon, you are mostly cloudy. You are sitting at 2 degrees uh, at the airport. Some sun poking out in some spots. Carmen, 3 degrees right now. Churchill, you're minus 3. But you're not the cold spot right now. George Island, minus 5 right now, is the cold spot in the province, which isn't too bad at all. The hot spot right now, Sprague, at a sizzling 10 degrees right now. Uh, Gimli, 2 degrees. Grand Rapids, 5 degrees right now. Gretna, 7 degrees. Genpeg, 5 degrees. Island Lake at the airport, sunny, 2 degrees. Lynn Lake at the airport, 2 degrees as well. Norway House at the airport, sunny, 5 degrees. Uh, Portage, mostly cloudy, 2 degrees for you right now. Tadouli Lake, cloudy, 3 degrees. Thompson, 5 degrees and partly cloudy. Uh, Wasagaming, 7 degrees, and Winnipeg at the Forks, 7 degrees. Well, it's only March, but with this sunny and warm weather, those with a green thumb may already be daydreaming about their gardens or maybe even have some started in their uh, home windows or something like that. And uh, Carla Hersina, uh, for Carla Hersina, it's her business to think about it. She is the co-owner and president of the St. Mary's Greenhouse just south of Winnipeg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Corey. So what's on your mind right now as you're prepping uh, the greenhouse (laughs) for a busy spring? (laughs) I wake up dream or not dreaming of plants. I wake up thinking plants. I go to bed thinking plants. It's plant soil moving. Yeah. And I imagine it's been this way probably since December too, eh? Well, you know what? We usually, in the older days, we used to start in December. Now we start end of January. But yeah, our focus in late December is okay. We know it's coming. Mm-hmm, right. And and so when do you expect things? Like, Is it already busy at the greenhouse for you right now? Or, or, is it gonna, or do you expect things to pick up in a, in a month or so? You know, people are starting to come in. They're starting to get that um, that spring itch where they want to see greenery. And uh, you know what? It's a wonderful place to get to the garden centers and just see what's happening. See what there's, um, you know, if you're wanting to get your seat, seating done early, it's good to get the selection going. But honestly, people that are coming in, I've been working in the back greenhouse, you see them go through the store, you see them go through, and as soon as they hit the greenhouse, there's almost this stop, pause, and you can see them just breathe in the mm-hmm. air, you know. So um, I call it that euphoric glow that I see on people when they walk into the greenhouse. It's like they get that sensory uh, feeling. Yes, 
We want our hands in the soil. How many people just come through, maybe don't buy a thing, they just come just to see some greenery and feel a little bit of warmth? <laughs> oh, you know what? Lot, all wind, like all, well, we're open year-round, so we see that quite a bit because our tropical houses stay open year-round. And, you know, even the other day, um, we have some very old upright pianos in there, and we've even had some people that come in through the wintertime and just want to sit down. And I could tell you the sound of piano in a greenhouse is – it just echoes and it's it just adds to the ambience. Oh, that's so lovely. Yeah. Um, oh, that's great. Um, in, in in the in the past, I know, uh, getting to kind of moving towards the, the business side of things, I know supply chain issues have been an issue for for seed supply. Uh, is, is that something you're worried about this year at all? Uh, for the seed supply, not on our, you know, um, on the commercial side of it. Yes, I've had a couple uh, hiccups in getting some varieties that I've really wanted to get. Um, on the consumer side for the packets that come in from, you know, our uh, supply companies, uh, Renee Seeds and Mackenzie's and your Lindbergh Seeds, they send us the seeds that they think are going to be there. So I, there's, you know, I just noticed a little absence on some tomatoes. You know, normally we have a lot of tomato seeds, and this year there's not as much on the offering. So. You know, and some people are coming in looking for a little bit more of the mix of some perennials, and I'm not finding those ones on the rack. But there may be an influence that you might want to see something different that, you know. So I guess what I'm saying is go early, find your seeds if you want to go into the seeding, because your best selection is to go early and look. Okay. Uh, and, and what do you think are the plants that are going to be trending th- this spring? Oh, that's, you know what, there's a lot of trends that are going, that in the trending garden like as in what do i do what style what colors there's a whole gambit of different stuff you know on sort of the trend as in how to garden uh night gardening is going to be taking a focus we're seeing a little bit more uh character of extending our hours in the garden so people are going a little bit more brighter plants that might be influencing the brighter plant aspect right what do you mean by that night gardening like just people just gardening be, well, later? They, or what? Well, night gardening is you're creating a space so that you're in your garden longer in the evening. More, you know, if the lights go down, sure, I'm going to sit on my deck and maybe have a little, that little bit more ambience of sitting on my deck and patio longer in the night hours or the darker hours. So, you know, we're going to be seeing, like in our industry, we're going to see a little bit more focus on maybe some garden accents that glow in the night and maybe the trend of having neon plants in the garden is going to bring that little bit of hue that's going to be a little bit brighter. So wait, I didn't know that that was an option. Oh yes. Like and wait, gl- like gl- like literally, they glow in the dark. Well, the sun goes down. Okay, there's the neon color plants. Is I'm talking bright chartreuse, like uh, Ipomea marguerite that have almost that lime yellow color tone. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is apparently on the gardening world a new petunia that's coming forward. That, but it's not available in Canada right now, so most people could just find it, find it on the Internet and look at it. But even planting, like that trend for staying later longer in your garden, um, we know that white is highly reflective, and we actually call those moon gardening. So if you have a lot of percentage of white flowers in the garden, they reflect moonlight. So um, I guess it reminds me of when I was younger and I had to paint the white rocks at the lake so at night when you're walking home you can follow the white rocks. So it's basically (laughs) that same sort of aspect. But um, on track, Corey, you had sort of touched the thing, what color? Well, there's that trend that's in there for that soft orange or that peachy color tone that I think people are going to look at because we're seeing a lot lot of that in um, the design style for home decor is that peach. And sometimes home decor drives certain colors in the horticulture industry too as well. So it's not just the cars that, that car colors that match <laughs> the, the trends. Maybe it's, you know, um, so the one that came to mind, and I'm sorry, I didn't have it with me before, but uh, and then I had an aha moment. There is a, a new dahlia that is really beautiful. It's called Revelation Soft Orange Dahlia. And it has that soft peach color undertone just with a hint or a kiss of pink in it which is really really pretty Ooh. yeah yeah and if you really want to go out there to have it where if you're that one's for a softer more romantic you know i would say more victorian uh color tone so we're also seeing some of it in um there is another one oh oh i got it crazy tuna crazy tunia 
Tiki Torch. And it is going to have that. I know. Isn't the, the, I want to be the person that names these colors. Oh, <laughs> me too. Like, it's beautiful. This is a little bit on the wilder side. And when you see crazy tunia variety petunias, you're going to understand where it comes from because the, the collections of colors that they have put into these plants are beautiful. So you're going to get that peachy color tone, yellow. You're going to get a little bit of a hot, vibrant fuchsia with this radiating burgundy star look in each flower. So it's kind of that wowza flower that's there. So bright is in, it seems like. Bright, you know what, it's everything. It's from that soft, peachy color tone mm-hmm. to bright. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes myself, too, I'm, I, I work it. I see the flowers every day, and I go, yeah, this is what I want. But mm-hmm. then you're inspired by the colors that you see. So mm-hmm. bring your game plan, and if you, it's like going grocery shopping. You go with the game plan, but you always find those other extras that <laughs> go in. Uh, what about on the um, on the veggie side of things? Are there like any neon pumpkins or something like coming out too? Or no neon pumpkins, okay. but the whites, uh, white pumpkins. I guess maybe because they glow at night, maybe. But a lot of white pumpkins are are favorable if you're looking. And that's one if you want to go into those novelty pumpkins, like I'm talking your uh, Cinderella types, or there's even some blue tones of pumpkins. You may want to be hunting those. Um, first. And I know that patty pan, we are sold out of patty pan squash. So that's going to be, I think, a little bit limited is are the patty pans. Okay. That's good to know. And I guess some, maybe some tomato varieties as well, like you hinted at before. So yeah, yeah. Check it. Cause normally we have a lot more tomatoes on our seed racks cause we carry a quite a few extensive lines on some. And this year just going through, I'm like, where's the tomatoes, you know? So mm-hmm. Who knows? Um, and, uh, and in terms of, you know, in terms of those folks, maybe they might be amateur gardeners or they're just kind of getting their mindset into the gardening mode. What, what should folks be thinking about right now as they start thinking about the, the spring? Um, think about spring is what do I want to do? What do I want to achieve? Am I going to put more of, if I'm growing, am I going to be growing more for food, which is a lot favorable because the uh, cost of food has risen. So we have the greatest summer weather so optimally, I would be looking at allotting a portion of my space to grow some tomatoes. Even if you have a small patio, put one or two plants on the patio. And the taste is going to be so much better than the grocery stores. Sorry, grocery stores. But homegrown is better. And even creating those little herb boxes. So I think there's going to still be a push in people growing their own food. So if you don't have the space indoors to start all those seedlings, uh, your garden centers will have some starts for you so that they can get advanced. And if you need the expertise, we're always willing to help you with, set up with what you need to put it in, what you need to grow up properly with. And uh, before I let you go here, I, I, I'm going I'm to put you on the spot. What is the one thing you're most excited to grow this year? I know you talked about a lot of things, but the one thing that you are going to be growing in your garden. Well, there's one that I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to pull my husband into this because I grew a new variety of tomato last year. It was called Mountain Man, and it was the best tomato. So I'm excited for that, too, because I've had, um, I, get, I guess I get my excitement out of what people want, you know. Um, I'm excited for my herbs. I love herbs, fresh baking, and like fresh cooking with herbs. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to get that Mountain Man back because I only put one plant in last year, and uh, it was the go-to when my husband went to pick the tomatoes in the, in the garden because it was like, plant more of that, you know? Is that the irony of your work, that you have spent so much time helping people garden that you have no time to garden? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of the shoemaker. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yes, but no, I love it. I, you know, and like I said, I get a focus on looking at some of the petunias and, and some of the plants that are here, and I absolutely fall in love with them. But on the day that I go to uh, pick out my plants, I'm always switching up. So plan, stick to the grocery list, stick to your plan if you want to, but it, but don't be deterred if you get teased by a different aisle when you see something that really pops up. Mm, I love that advice. Well, Carla, thanks so much, and, and all the best ahead of this very busy season ahead of you. Thank you so much, Corey. Carla Hersina is the co-owner and president of the St. Mary's Greenhouse, just north of Winnipeg. Jarrett Martineau hosts Reclaimed. 
in an hour you could hear everything from powwow music to like a soft acoustic ballad to an electronic record to like a dub track all in the same hour from an indigenous artist from any part of the world. Eclecticism is an overused word, obviously, but I think the sheer diversity that gets represented on the show is something that's totally unique. Reclaimed with Jarrett Martineau. Available now on CBC Listen. And by north of Winnipeg, I mean south of Winnipeg. (laughs) Don't want to go north. You're going to miss it entirely. Don't miss what's coming up, though. We're going to hear about an exotic bird rescue uh, in Ontario. But first, your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. At 12.30, we're at plus 7 with partly cloudy skies over downtown Winnipeg. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Humphrey. A new poll shows Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe's popularity is growing. The Angus Reid poll found 63% of respondents approve of Canoe's performance. That's up six points from his last poll. Christopher Adams is a political studies professor at the University of Manitoba. I would say this poll is still um, in the honeymoon phase, but after we get our first budget, a picture of, of what's being spent in health care and education and, and uh, controlling the deficit, I think that's when we will start seeing um, people having views of how this government is, is uh, working. Adams says Canoe has faced little opposition since he was elected. He also says the poll sampling of Manitobans is very small, narrow, with less than 400 participants. Fires at two large apartment buildings in Winnipeg within the past month alone have displaced around 100 people. Now some of those people are struggling to find a new place to live due to a lack of affordable rentals. The latest numbers from the CMHC show a 1.8% rental vacancy rate for Winnipeg, down from 2.7%. In January of last year, the average rent for a two-bedroom is just over 1400 a month, a 4.4% increase since 2022. And the movie Oppenheimer swept last night's Academy Awards in Los Angeles. Here's Eli Glasner with your details. And Maria, I see Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, the film that went into the show with 13 nominations, left with seven wins, including Robert Downey Jr. for Best Supporting Actor. I'd like to thank my terrible childhood (laughs) and the Academy in that order. Director Christopher Nolan's film about the father of the atomic bomb took home some of the biggest prizes, such as Best Picture and Director. But it was the weird and wonderful film Poor Things that delivered one of the evening's few surprises. Killers of the Flower Moon's Lily Gladstone was widely expected to win Best Actress. Instead, it was a shaken Emma Stone who accepted the award. Oh boy, this is really... This is really overwhelming. While many of this year's Canadian nominees fell short, Halifax filmmaker Ben Proudfoot picked up his second Oscar for the short documentary feature, The Last Repair Shop. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Los Angeles. And that's your CBC News from Winnipeg. For news anytime, you can head on over to our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba, or you can use the CBC News app. I watched Poor Things this weekend. It's great, huh? It's great. It's great. Definitely advice don't watch it with your parents <laughs> i didn't but when i was thinking about it, I'm like this would be an awful movie to watch with your parents that'll make sense if people don't know what we're talking about yeah you just watch uh, yeah. maybe watch a trailer or something then you'll be like okay I, yeah that's my warning if you're just looking for a movie night with the folks definitely not that's not the one but the message is good <laughs> and the uh there's a few quotable lines in that one for sure yes very quotable yes well uh, thank you very much matt and willem willem defoe oh yeah you can't even stop that guy. He just makes movies. Eh? I know. I could watch that guy blow weird bubbles all day. Read the that's phone also, book. Yeah. yeah, that's very strange. Very strange. Back okay. Soon. Yeah. Very, yes, yeah. That is Matt Humphrey at our CBC News desk. That is a very strange movie, but it is a very good movie. I, I, I'll give it a, <laughs> I'll give it a, a, a four stars. Why okay. Not? Okay. Well, Riley, uh, the weather looks almost five star, depending almost. on how you like, uh, how you like your weather. Yeah, we're looking at a fairly calm day across Manitoba today. Uh, looking at satellite radar, we do have uh, a little few bits of shower, uh, as expected, moving through uh, parts of uh, central Manitoba. And 
Uh, really, uh, really not much to write home about. Some of this likely not even making it to the ground, uh, but I'm looking at uh, some radar returns in the area of, say, Dauphin through St. Rose, uh, through the Lake Manitoba Narrows. Shouldn't be too much to be concerned about. We will see some of that kind of tapering off as we get through the day today. Uh, starting Tuesday, mainly sunny skies uh, once again across uh, most of Manitoba. A little bit of cloud cover further to the north, but uh, by and large, we're looking at a mainly sunny start to the day tomorrow. We will start to see some clouds building in, though, as we get into the early part of Wednesday. And this is when we could see a little bit of instability moving across southern Manitoba. So I'm looking at first thing in the morning on Wednesday, the potential for uh, maybe some flurries through the Brandon region up through uh, Russell Roblin uh, into Verdon. First thing in the morning, maybe some mixing, but uh, for the most part, we're looking at a mainly cloudy day. Some of this uh, could lead us to some flurries through the late afternoon, early evening on Wednesday for the Winnipeg region. So uh, right now we're looking at temperatures uh, around or above the freezing mark across uh, much of Manitoba. Thompson right now is at plus three, uh, plus ones around uh, Swan River, Dauphin and Roblin. Uh, Wasagaming right now is at plus seven uh, and Winnipeg is at plus five right now. And we're looking at temperatures uh, above normal for this time of the year continuing. Thompson and looking at a high of seven degrees this afternoon, six through Barron's River, uh, three in Brandon, a mainly sunny sky, and I've got six in the forecast uh, for Winnipeg. Uh, like I said, chance of a late day flurry as we get through uh, the day on t- uh, on Wednesday, uh, two degrees for both Tuesday and Wednesday in Winnipeg. Thursday, some sunny breaks of the afternoon, and then uh, maybe a little bit of interestingness happening through the later part of the week. Chance of some rain and some snow as we get through the day on Friday. Southwest winds gust to 40, and that turns into a chance of early morning flurries on Saturday with a uh, temperature at zero. Thank you very much, Riley. No problem. That is CBC Weather Specialist Riley Lechuk. Twelve thirty-six here on Radio Noon. I'm Corey Funk in from Marjorie Dow House, and still to come on the show, uh, we're going to hear the story of a young woman who struggles with obsessive compulsive disorder and how find out how she copes with that condition. But first, a little bit of music from his album Sanctity of Silence. Here's Winnipeg's Noah Dirksen with "You Got a Hold on Me." You're hearing it right here on CBC Radio One.
That's Noah Dirksen with You Got a Hold on Me. He was on uh, our morning show, well, afternoon show, uh, uh, I think a few months back, and we started kind of chatting after the show, and we did the classic Winnipeg uh, Mennonite game. It turns out we uh, grew up about uh, just a few blocks away from each other in North Caledonian River East area, so such a small Manitoba world <laughs> we live in. Well, 1240 right now here on a Radio Noon. Uh, Winnipeg right now, we are sitting at five degrees and sunny. Well, next up on the show, the latest in a special series produced by a team of aspiring teenage filmmakers. They're all taking part in Create, an entertainment arts training program at Sisler High School. And today, students Marcus Ramiscal, Gabriel Bezo, and Bridget Clemente share the story of a young Winnipeg woman living with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Calandra Stroot takes us inside her daily struggles and reveals her worst moment that landed her in the hospital. Here's her story. My name, My is, name is Calandra Stroot. My pronouns are she, her. I'm, I like to keep things clean. I like to wash my hands. So I do a lot of hand washing. I do a lot of showering. I do a lot of cleaning. Um, yeah, and I have a lot of obsessions about contamination. With obsessions, they are unwanted, they're persistent, thoughts, images, or urges that people feel compelled to respond to. Perfect. So I've got blood on my hand now. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is what I meant with the digging into the cuticles to clean them out. And I do that. Every little thing that I do, I have to think about and think about the consequences that it could have. Um, and what sort of compulsions it could lead to. It's, it's really just, it's kind of agonizing and it never ends. I once tried to describe it kind of like a, um, a black tar on your hand that nobody can see except you. And as you go around day to day, everything that you put your hand on, you leave this sticky tar handprint and everything that other people touch, now they get the tar on their hands and it so spreads yeah, it and it spreads and it spreads exponentially. But it doesn't matter to anybody spot. else, it only matters to me because I'm the only one who can see it. What's the difference between someone who has OCD and someone who's maybe a little obsessive is the fact that it is unwanted and it's intrusive and that it takes up ample amount of people's time in a day. I was getting ready for my first exam and I suddenly I couldn't touch my binder and there was something wrong with my binder and every time that I went and I grabbed my binder I was getting in and out of the shower I think I took three or four showers in about two hours um, and I was just every time I would get out I would get dressed and then I would be have it like I would try to get back to my work and have the same panic attack over and over again nobody in the house could get me to calm down from it and so at that point we went looking for outside help and that was really the breaking point and I would describe that as a by the end of the day or the three days it was about a 72 hour long panic attack where I would exhaust myself and so I couldn't keep having the physical panic attack but the mental part of it never stopped. We need to learn to become vulnerable. I always say that vulnerability is the birthplace to happiness. By being vulnerable and showing our vulnerability <laughs> is the opportunity for us to be able to reach out and get that professional help. Wallace, a psychiatric nurse in Winnipeg specializing in OCD treatment. Now, that story was produced by Sisler Create students Marcus Ramiscal, Gabriel Bezo, and Bridget Clemente. Sisler Create is now accepting applications for post high school students for programs starting this September. You can check out their website, sislercreate.com, for more information. And if you want to watch that video of the story you just heard, uh, you can just go to cbc.ca slash creator network. MB. 
There are stories you just can't stop thinking about. They take you somewhere, they introduce you to someone, they share something new with you. Lift off. Those are the stories you want to share with your friends, and CBC's award-winning documentary team is bringing them to you every week on Storylines. Storylines, new this season on CBC Radio 1, and always on demand on the CBC Listen app. Well, it would be easy to imagine that this is the sound of a daycare or the zoo. Well, in fact, it's Parrot Partners, a rehab and retirement facility for 55 exotic birds in Ontario. And often these birds have been relinquished by their owners because they can no longer take care of them. And CBC's Amanda Putz dropped by to meet the birds and the founder and executive director, Judy Tennant. <laughs> So this is the running of the, of the organization. Uh, right now we're about to feed. Uh, you're catching it before it's been cleaned. Um, but uh, this, is, this is a real aviary. <laughs> this guy we call Merle the Squirrel. He's a, uh, <laughs> he's a male eclectus. They come from Australia. And uh, the eclectuses are the, uh, one of the few parrots that don't mate monogamously. They cheat on each other, both the females and males. So it's an understanding, so it's okay. <laughs> That's one of the reasons that they uh, are stressed, because they're flock animals. They, uh, they know their safety in numbers. And the bigger the numbers, the safer they are. And so when we sell them singular, it really is does do a disservice to them. So one of the one of the rehabilitations is having them in here and having them settle so that they can learn, so that they can um, we can work with them when they're relaxed, as opposed to thinking that at any moment they could be um, killed by an eagle, snake, or spider. She's a Congo African grey. The Congo African greys are endangered in the wild and that's because of the pet trade. And what we have when humans, there's a high demand uh, for a certain bird, it means that they either can talk, they're stunningly beautiful, or they're hard to reproduce in captivity. Uh, so the Congo African Grey is one of the best talkers. They can talk uh, in the voice of a male, a female, and a child. So it's very easy to be able to tell what sort of home they've come from because they repeat what they hear. They need to be comfortable to speak. So every bird is different with their comfort level. She's curious, she's not nervous, but I don't think she's comfortable enough to, to chat. It's really important that when a bird tells us no, that we, we respect that. And that's why we're called Parrot Partners, is that it is a partnership. They, they train us, we train them, but we set the parameters on what will be trained <laughs> with them. Really? really? Everybody, <laughs> everybody, uh, everybody here is fully flighted. We don't have an aggressive, uh, a highly aggressive one. This is Rosie. She's a female Alexandria, and she's in our retirement program. That's one of the key things that is needed with uh, a species that lives as long as parrots live. What is the longest living bird, and what and range? We'd say 65 in the, would be about the median, and then you can get others that can go into 80s, right? But then you're getting on the tail end of the of the bell curve. So. That many, that many years, and they're a serially rehomed animal. Because people think, oh, this will be so cute, this will be so wonderful, and they start plucking, they start screaming, they start attacking, uh, and people don't know how to handle that, so they give them up, and they go from home to home to home. And every jump, their behavior gets worse because that's so unnatural for them. They're born into a flock, they die out of a flock. And here they keep being parachuted into an unknown predator's environment. It's nerve wracking for them. This is actually not as loud as I thought it would be. 
Oh. Yeah. We're going into the detention hall soon. That's where the cockatoos are, so it is going to get louder. All right, so this, these birds are the finishing school? These birds have learned lessons really well. They know that if uh, they are either use indoor voice, which they're doing, or if they're quiet and come forward in the cage, that is a reinforceable behavior. Again, we're teaching something which isn't naturally uh, occurring in the wild. So, but they're very smart, they're willing to learn, and that's what's required is that uh, somebody teach them what's expected and then generalize that to all humans. We do this not just with the trainers, we do it with all humans, and then that allows us to place them in a home and have them be an easier companion. <laughs> call this the frat house. <laughs> You'll see why. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Animal House. <laughs> Very similar to that with food fights, food being thrown, things being completely destroyed. All from young male macaws. <laughs> Okay, Judy, we've seen some incredible birds today, but I'm not sure anything can beat the macaw. Uh, the macaws are pretty stunning for sure. They're a hard bird to place because of their destruction capability. Uh, the door is completely chewed away at the bottom, like as though a giant dog attack. It is difficult to meet all of their chewing needs in captivity. Also, when they bite, there's much more damage to the human. Ha, 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 ha. Be nice, guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I have a... Ooh. <laughs> you just step one step back, that's all. I have a beautiful blue... A blue macaw, he's a hyacinth macaw. You're beautiful. 30 centimeters from my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> there are a million parrots in Canada and there's no support under them. Not only is there no uh, behavioral and training support, but there's no support when uh, they're homeless and people are forced to sell them and they jump from home to home to home. When they're elderly, that's when they're the most vulnerable and there's, there's no facility that can afford to run um, a retirement home for birds. And that's what we're hoping we'll be able to do. That's Judy Tennant of Parrot Partners in Carleton Place, Ontario. It found itself in a $65,000 shortfall due to pandemic closures, followed by avian flu closures. And after the community rallied to fundraise, it's been able to stay open for parrot rehabilitation. If you're curious about it, you can visit parrotpartners.org for more information. My friend, when I lived in St. John's, had a parrot. And, uh, of course, they did teach it a bunch of swear words. But also, it uh, at, when they were eating breakfast every day, this is what it just started doing on its own, it knew as soon as they were done eating breakfast that they would go brush their teeth. So right when they were finishing up breakfast every day, it would go, ch -ch 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 -ch. it would start making toothbrushing noises on its own. Because that's just how smart those parrots are. Such fascinating creatures. So cool. Well, we got time for a little bit of music uh, before the end of the show here. From Edmonton singer-songwriter Amanda Penner, this is... She's a forest fighter.
from Edmonton. That's Amanda Penner with She's a Forest Fire. Well, we're coming up to the end of the show, but first I've got Chloe Friesen in the studio because she's sitting in the host chair for Faith Fundal today on Up to Speed. Hi there, Chloe. Hello, Corey. So what are you, uh, what you working on? So the Oscars were last night. Now we're looking forward, or at least I'm looking forward to the Canadian Screen Awards. The Oscars of Canada. The Oscars of Canada. Um, and a local Cree actor is actually up for Best Drama Performance at the Canadian Screen Awards for the show Little Bird, which is, I've seen it, it's incredible. Also up for Best Drama of the Year at the Screen Awards. Wow. So we get to talk to Darla Contois. The lead actress huge. in Little Bird, which is huge. So exciting. Her performance was amazing. I'm so excited to talk to her. I wonder how it feels to like wake up and be like, oh, I'm nominated for like the best in Canada. Yes. As an actress. That's huge. It's huge. Great show. Highly recommend. But yeah, we'll talk to Darla on Up to Speed. So definitely stay tuned for that. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Chloe. That is Chloe Friesen sitting in the guest, the host chair for Faith Fundal today on Up to Speed. You can catch that interview on the show from 3 to 6 today. Well, that is a wrap for the Monday edition of Radio Noon. It was a pleasure spending the noon hour with you. A special thanks to all the folks who helped put together today's show. Riley Lechak, Matt Humphrey, Kalkadan Muluketa, Travis Peterson, Mae McKillop, Nelly Gonzalez, Leif Larson, and I'm Corey Funk in for Marjorie Dowhouse. I'll be back on Friday. Uh, good to spend this afternoon with you. I hope you have a lovely sunny day. You're listening to CBC Radio 1. Coming up next, the next chapter. Have a good day. <laughs>